If you are worried you have Lyme disease, or just like the outdoors, and want the peace of mind of knowing whether you have Lyme disease or not, there is a new Lyme screening test based on decades of research by Dr. Richard Marconi, a professor at VCU Medical Center. For more information, visit glymedx.com. That's G-L-Y-M-E-D-X.com. Or email at info at glymedx.com. Infectious diseases, research, medicine, health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Well, now the internet has been flooded by every imaginary news source covering a story about a man who claimed he ate sushi on a daily basis, who presented to his doctor a five and a half foot long tapeworm. This originated from a podcast called This Won't Hurt a Bit, where a Fresno, California physician told the story. So what was this parasite and what other parasitic and bacterial risks are associated with raw sushi? Well, joining me now to answer these questions is Bobby Pritt, MD. Dr. Pritt is a professor of laboratory medicine and pathology, and she's the director of clinical parasitology laboratory at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Dr. Pritt, welcome back to the show, ma'am. Thank you, Robert. It's good to be here. Thank you for coming on. I appreciate it. All right. So you read the news accounts. Um, if you Maybe you listened to the podcast. Yes, I did. You Quite did. interesting. Yeah, and uh, a little sensationalized, but yes, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and there was a picture. Some some of the articles presented a picture of the tapeworm, and yeah, they were great photos. Great photos. Now it's been described as a Japanese broad tapeworm. So, based on your expertise, based on what you can tell, size, description, and the pics available, is this the offending parasite? Well, it definitely appears to be a related parasite, if not the Japanese uh, broad tapeworm. Um, so it's a Diphilobothrium species. That's a fish tapeworm. And based on the length, the width of the portion that we could see, the shape of those little individual units called proglottids, and um, those little dark dots that we saw, those are the uterine structures, I feel comfortable calling it Diphilobothrium. But it's really hard to call it a specific species without doing molecular analysis. So what we can say is, given the patient's described love for raw sushi, and <laughs> especially salmon, it's very possible that this is the Japanese tapeworm Diphilobothrium nihonkaiense. And um, that particular species has been found in Pacific salmon from Alaska, which we know is transported throughout the United States. So it's probable based on the history, but I, can't, I don't think we could say for sure. Right. But now... You said it's, it could be Diphilobothrium. I hope I don't butcher this. <laughs> Diphilobothrium. Yeah. And Nihon Kiensis. Nihon, yes. Nihon Kiensis. Okay. And so um, I, I noticed there's been some recent reports uh, in like emerging infectious diseases that maybe this thing is a little bit more common than, we, than what we thought. Yeah, that's a good point because there are other Diphilobothrium species. Diphilobothrium latum, we know, is endemic in North American fish, but the thought is that Diphilobothrium nihonkaiens is the second most common species that we see. But honestly, people haven't really done a full analysis of all the different fish tapeworms that people report with. So, yeah, it's, it's, it is quite common is what we believe. And what, what kind of uh, disease, what kind of pathology would a tapeworm like this cause? Well, um, it most of the time does not cause a symptomatic infection. And it's interesting because it's a really big worm. Right. This large worm can grow to lengths of more than 10 meters. Um, you know, that's more than 30 feet. Uh, but despite that all being coiled up in your intestine, most infected individuals don't have any symptoms. And they usually don't even know they're infected until they, like this gentleman, passed a large section of worm, um, which is obviously quite disturbing for the patient, and then presents with it to his physician. Um, now, sometimes people can have some nonspecific gastrointestinal symptoms like abdominal discomfort, diarrhea, vomiting, nausea, weight loss. 
And another interesting manifestation of infection is vitamin B12 deficiency, and that can cause anemia and neurologic symptoms. Um, but I will say that it's, it's really rare that serious complications occur. Uh, one serious complication would be intestinal obstruction, like in a really heavy infection, but that fortunately is very rare. In the intestine, is it, is it common to see, see many, many of these large adults? You can have more than one, but it's not common. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, let's get off of that tapeworm. And, <laughs> and, and let's talk about what other parasitic risks are associated with raw sushi. There's, there's others that are more common. Yeah, well, you know, it's a great question. It depends partially on where you are in the world and where your fish came from. And, of course, today you can transport fish on ice to just about any part of the world. And if it's not fully frozen, there may be all sorts of parasites in there. But um, some of the ones that we see would be uh, some flatworms called flukes, like Clonorchis sinensis, the so-called Chinese liver fluke. And there's a related fluke called Opisthorchis. And then there's a number of uh, less common intestinal flukes. There's also um, these round worms called anisacids. And these are one of my favorite parasites because they can be found in fish flesh pretty easily. Um, I can go to the grocery store and get some frozen cod, for example, and dissect them. It's kind of unappetizing to think about this. (laughs) Um, And I can pretty easily find them coiled up in fish flesh. And then I can use them for teaching. And I'll teach medical students or other physicians. And so it's kind of a pretty effective display. Interesting. And you can find anisacids in a variety of fish, including cod and herring and salmon. And this is just this list is just a few of the parasites you can get from eating undercooked right. fish. And anisakiasis, yep. if you do have it, there is, there is a distinct pathology. There's some serious pain that goes along with that. Oh, right? yeah. Yeah, if you have a worm trying to burrow into your stomach lining, that usually necessitates an emergent trip to uh, the hospital to get that removed. Yeah. Okay. How about microbial risk, like bacterial risk? Uh, What's out there? There are some bacterial risks as well. Uh, Some of the ones that are more commonly known are infections with salmonella and vibrio species. Those are two bacteria that are associated with eating raw or undercooked fish and shellfish. And the infections can be pretty severe. You can get bloody diarrhea, abdominal cramps, and really severe dehydration. So it's definitely not just the parasites you need to worry about when you're talking about undercooked fish. Sure. Now, there's no doubt that these are rare. And like I said, this was probably a very uh, sensationalized case. It was all over the Internet. Um, But it's also, based on what you're telling me, there is some risk. Um, There is. Of course, the more you expose yourself to a source like raw fish, the greater the risk. Well, the greater the likelihood you're going to get one of these parasites. Right. So what is being, what is done by uh, the fish uh, producers and what can people do to minimize the risk of getting a parasite via raw sushi? Well, the fish producers do do some uh, things. They will check out their fish before selling it. But I think most people, if you talk to uh, people who sell fish in grocery stores, they'll tell you that it's just a fact of life, that fish have parasites. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's really up to the consumer to make sure um, they take precautions. So the FDA would say, don't eat it raw. <laughs> uh, they would say, cook your fish adequately, which if you're going to measure it, that would be an internal temperature of at least 145 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, it's a little easier to just say that it should be kind of firm and flaky. If it's a white fish, it would be nice and white and flaky. Um, but having said that, there's a lot of popularity with certain raw fish dishes like sushi, and they can have important health benefits. So I guess the good news is that there are things you can do to prepare and store your fish and then eat it undercooked or raw. Um, Freezing is what is most commonly used, and any restaurant that's serving sushi in the United States should be freezing the fish for an appropriate period of time before serving it. All right, Dr. Pritt, one last question. Um, You talked about going to the grocery store and getting some cod, and you open it up, and you find the parasites. Yeah. But just to let the audience know, if you cook that cod, you're not going to get infected. No, and the good news, too, is I'm buying frozen cod fillets, and they've been in the freezer for 
weeks and weeks, I'm sure. So it's all dead. It's really just yep. uh, more for show. Yeah. Now, having said that, if you see one, do you want to really eat it? Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure it'll gross out even the most uh, tough guy. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, thank you very much for that information, Dr. Bobby Pritt. I appreciate your time and expertise.